Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at documentary filmmaking. I'm your host, Christian Taylor. My co-host, Jason Rugg, has the day off again today because actually it is the same day uh, that we recorded the podcast two weeks ago. You'll notice we have on the same clothes if you're watching this. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I just didn't want Joe to get away. We had so much more to talk about and I figured we could do a second podcast. And I am joined by my friend, uh, a friend of the show and amazing guest that can fill Jason's shoes, Joe Amade of Virgil Films and Entertainment. Thank you Howdy for being again, back everybody. again this week. How does Jason <laughs> right, get a day are, off? I mean, what's that well, all about? He's, he says to me, Christian, I can't make it today. And I say, oh, okay. Because, you know, I don't pay him that, that much. I can't really say, you got to be here. Anyway, Jason is busy himself. He's got an animation career and he's uh, writing scripts. He's now a voiceover actor. So he's, I mean, I think he had 18 voiceover jobs, you know, for the last couple of wow. weeks. So he's a busy guy. Good for him. Yeah. I know. I'm proud of him. Uh, yes. All right. So let's jump back in. First of all, real quick, everybody, full disclosure, Joe is my distributor. Uh, I have him on here because uh, we, we have developed a friendship. He is uh, one of the greatest guys I know, aside from just you know being a distributor. But what I love about him is that he's honest, open, transparent, willing to talk to anybody. Uh, I just trust him implicitly. And um, I think everybody should know about him and about his company. So Joe, tell us a little bit real quick about Virgil Film and what you guys do. Yeah, so we are a traditional distributor. We go out and acquire the rights to feature films, and then we take those films and we try to get them exploited on Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, Apple+, Plus, um, iTunes, Vudu, Amazon, you name it. Wherever you can see a film online or on DVD, because we still release a lot of our movies on DVD, uh, we put those movies out and those rights can include TV rights and digital rights and theatrical rights. So our films that we have put into theaters, we, we continue to do that. And we're actually, we're actually starting to do it. Um, just landed a, a one night, uh, special event screening of your film. Um, the girl who wore freedom, Newtown, which is so exciting. Newtown, or, yeah. Newtown theater in Pennsylvania um, to celebrate the upcoming anniversary of, uh, of uh, D-Day. And so we, we try to, you know, do as much as we can with the film for the for the length of time that we have those rights for, and that's kind of what we do. And we don't, we don't. There are companies out there that release twenty movies a month. They just throw them up there. We are not that type of company. We release two a month, maybe three, because we like to take the time with the filmmaker to create a plan, a strategy to put the film out, and then we continue to sell the film or try to sell the film well after the film has been out because there could be something happening the following year or the or two years later that will enable you to get additional sales on the film now it, it sounds really like oh my god we're really helping a filmmaker make money but you know the truth is if the filmmaker makes money that means we're making money if right. we're not making money right. the filmmaker's right. not making money so it's not you know it is a business it is a film business so it, we're beholden to continue to try to sell that movie three years after it comes out. Yeah. Well, and of course, <laughs> I appreciate that very much since ours now is a little bit of an old title. Thankfully, it's mm -hmm. an evergreen one. Every year D-Day comes up, there's a lot of military things and we're going to have big yes. anniversaries, 80th, 85th. And hopefully uh, the shelf life for this, you know, the girl who wore freedom will be pretty long. So I can attest you guys are willing to, you know, what I love is when I say, Hey, there's this platform out there or, Hey, do you think you could look into this for me? Um, I really, you know, said, I think we, we've got to have some French distribution. And I mean, we're going to have some exciting news about that to share, you know, pretty recently. So uh, you guys have been working hard for me to make sure that we, you know, squeeze every opportunity out of this film. You know, one of the things that you just mentioned that we, we never really talk about, and this is really directly to filmmakers is there is a lot of companies out there that will offer to put your film up on their platform. And 95% of them will take your film, put it up and you will never hear from them again. And this is not a commercial for Virgil because there are other companies just as good as Virgil, but there's a lot of companies out there that are trying to create a new streaming platform. And we hesitate moving forward with any of them because, one, no, the, the average consumer 
is cutting cable. They're cutting right. streaming because they have too many already. And to expect right. them to join yet another one and one that they've never heard of and one that when they go look at that site, they've never heard of the movies on it because these companies are not getting big movies. Um, I We shy away. And we, we've gotten to a point where unless there is something really compelling about that new company that's pitching us, we don't do it. Because, again, it takes time, takes effort. And it takes money to get your film put up on any kind of platform, whether it be a small one or a big one. Yeah, you know, you brought up an interesting point is something I wanted to talk about anyway. And that is sort of the nature of the business and how things have changed. And, it, you know, it's been so dramatic from when I started making this film. There was a whole, you know, way that you went about things back, you know, six years ago. And then, of course, with COVID, so many things happen. But I mean, even in the last since December, with Netflix coming out and saying, maybe we should license more content. I mean, there's been a whole nother shift in the industry. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, the recent changes and what you predict for 2024. Because like you said, I think people are simply tired of having all these different streaming services that you're having to pay for along with cable. And I just see the entertainment industry is going to continue to go through some really seismic shifts. What are your thoughts? I think the seismic shifts that we will see, um, and this is just a prediction, nothing else but a prediction, um, will be in the consolidation of companies. We've already seen Paramount and Showtime consolidate. Paramount is up for sale, so to speak, right now. Right. So someone, a big, a big company like an Apple or an Amazon or maybe even a Netflix could eat them up, buy them. You know, yeah, um, we're seeing Hulu integrate with Disney as we speak. You know, if you go on the Disney platform right now, you see Hulu titles, which is kind right. of strange when you're seeing um, a Hulu title next to an old Disney title. You know, and that's something that they're working on and, and, and that they need that they need to address. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you're going to see consolidation. Now, does consolidation mean lower prices for the consumer? Not yet. <laughs> we haven't seen that yet. But sooner or later, you know, the consumer is the one that at the end of the day, the consumer is king. And if they continue to cut services, cut cable, then the, the, the streamers and the cable companies are going to be forced to, you know, either lower their prices or consolidate. Um, and that's probably the biggest shift that I think the consumer is going to see. From a filmmaker point of view, all of those shifts um, affect what we do, what a distributor does, because when we use Paramount and Showtime, you had two completely different companies that we were pitching movies to. Now there's one, and it really hasn't been figured out who's doing that yet, you know, and that's going to take months. So that that change and that upsetting of the market will continue through 2024. Um, I don't think that's going to get any any better. Um, I don't think in two months all of the mergers or buyouts are going to auto just magically change. I don't. Then you get to the top of the top of the top, and I see Netflix. And what I'm seeing at Netflix now, and I was I was in the building last week. What I'm seeing at Netflix now is more of a calming, strategic move um, and getting, I don't want to say getting their, just getting their stuff together more than it seems like it has been. I think the layoffs will calm down. I think they're putting uh, strategic people in strategic positions to move forward. Um, I do think they will open up their purse strings for more licensing, but I don't feel that it's going to be as wide as we really want it to be. Um, but I do believe when it comes to documentaries, if it's a really, really good documentary, um, that they would be more apt to license it than they would have been two years ago or even a year ago. I, I feel a little bit more hopeful. I mean, I think yeah. uh, when streaming, like in 2020, maybe 2021, I think there was a feeling like all of these big guys are going to vertically integrate 
They're going to make their own content. They're not going to look for content outside. And there was truth to that. I mean, the buying kind of stopped and shut stopped. down. And it stopped. <laughs> yeah, it really stopped. And so there was this fear like, gosh, where is our stuff going to go? And I think there is still something to all of that. I mean, I think they will consolidate and they're going to license each other's content among the big guys, right? Yes. Um, and so I think they are, you know, there's not as much chance as there was 10 years ago for an independent person to have their stuff, you know, licensed by, you know, a big outlet. But I do feel a little bit more hope that there's, you know, a little bit of a crack um, that maybe we can have an opportunity that wasn't there before. That's the truth. That's exactly what's happening. But you still, as a filmmaker, when you're dealing with with distribution or you're finished your film, you still have to wrap your head around the fact that as of today, in most cases, your revenue is coming from rentals, transactional, making sure your movie is up on iTunes and Amazon and Vudu and every other, you know, recognizable site that people go to 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 rent movies to view or download movies to own. That is key. And that is where marketing, any kind of social media continues to have to be driven towards. Um, exploring one night theatricals, movie theaters are empty. Art house cinemas are empty Monday through Thursday, really Monday through Wednesday. Um, to be able to take your film and play it for one night or two nights in those theaters helps out the transactional and brings in some money. It doesn't bring in hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars, but it brings in some money. Um, there are companies that can do that, that specialize in that. Um, so there are more opportunities, but the, the opportunities out there still are not matching what the big Netflix play would be. You yeah. Know? Um, and I think, I think the hard part for us filmmakers, you know, I think filmmakers are still under the impression that I have this film. It's a fantastic film. Uh, certainly I can find, you know, a cable channel or some sort of, you know, maybe even public broadcasting. They're going to take it. I'm going to get an upfront fee. And that is, you know, kind of everybody's dream. But the reality is because of the shift in the market, um, you know, the best thing, you know, oftentimes, or the more realistic things I should say is exactly what you said. They're going to go up on platforms and um, you want to make sure that you can. And that's why, you know, you are still grandfathered into the Amazon situation. There are a lot of distributors that aren't allowed to put stuff up anymore. And I have been told, and maybe it's not true, um, but as an independent filmmaker that I can't just go and put my film up on Amazon yeah. anymore. Yeah. You can't. So, um, the, but the hard part about this new model and this new world that we've inhabited is that it, there's nowhere to advertise really about your film, you know, in a way that makes sense. So yes, I could buy stuff on social media for tons of money. There's no way for me to figure out if that investment has any sort of return. It's just like throwing money to the wind because- yeah. You know, and that's why we have focused a lot on trying to um, do screenings for our film because they will pay a fee. Exactly like you said, um, you know, it's it, people are dying to see films in theaters now. And that's a wonderful opportunity. I'm going to give David Patterson props. He's the producer on The Girl Who Wore Freedom. We've had him on the show before. He's an awesome guy. He uh, just, his first film he ever did ended up in Sundance. And so he's now a part of this Sundance world. Uh, and what he's been able to do is take the list of outlets that Sundance gives every filmmaker to be able to contact them. And he's like, you know, we're going to go out for these exhibitors and theaters and we're going to you know, do a full court press to get them to take the girl who wore freedom during this year because, and they are, we've already gotten responses back from even Alamo draft house, believe it or not, wow, that's great. Who are, you know, interested in, in showing the film. So great. it does help that it's the 80th anniversary of D-Day, but um, I think that's the kind of work you have to do. If you want to make money in your film, gone are the days of just giving it to a distributor and hoping you're going to get some money back without, and you move on to your next project. I mean, I just don't no, think that. We, 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 we fully expect our filmmakers to partner with us on the release of their film. We tell them it's in our contract that we will not go out and hire 
a PR firm. It's, it's, you know, the, the reason that we only release a couple of movies a, a month is that it will give us the time to work with the filmmaker. Nobody knows the film better than the filmmaker. Nobody. Right. Because the filmmaker has lived it. Uh, we've seen it for 90 minutes or 80 minutes. We fully expect ideas to come from the filmmaker. They need to work the title. It's, it's you know, again, you just said it. The glory days are gone. Yeah. They're done. And anybody that relies on them is just, you know, is just looking for sadness and disappointment. And frustration. Um, yeah. And frustration. Because, you know, again, it, it does happen every once in a while. We, you know, I think we talked about this on the last podcast, but there's only so many Blair Witch projects, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and they're one a decade. So you can't rely on them. Um, so you got to work. It's, 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 it's work. It's work. And it's finding a good distributor that will do the bulk of it is what the filmmaker needs to do. And then the filmmaker at some point, if they're filmmakers, I should say, move on to your next film. Cause that's, yeah. that's what you do, but you have to find a distributor that you can, that you can rely on. Right. Well, can we talk a second about um, the process of distributing a film? Um, you know, people I've heard filmmakers say, you know, yeah, my film was distributed and by Lionsgate, for example, I've never received a check because always, you know, uh, they're taking distribution expenses and it's sure. this big, you know, uh, yeah. big thing that I never get to look into. Now, distribution expenses are a thing. I've had to pay them myself, but guess what, Joe? I don't understand what those distribution expenses are and most filmmakers don't either. So can you explain when I give you a film to distribute, what costs are there in distributing that film? So it's pretty simple. Um, there, and if the filmmaker really thinks about it, um, someone has to create the artwork for the cover. And whether that cover be the front and the back of a DVD box, and that artwork front and back needs to be to a certain spec. Now, and again, I'm going to be answering your question, but... I'm not the person that does that. I have really good people that do this. Yes, you do. Um, and, and it's also sent out to art designers to do it, and there's a cost to send it to them. So that's just for the physical part of it. When you deliver a film to iTunes or Netflix is a perfect example. You had, you know, your poster art. Right. Of the girl who referred. Yep. Netflix wants 19 versions of that poster art. Why? Nin 19. Do you know that? Sometimes if you look on your phone and, and you pull up Netflix and you see your title and then you go on your computer, the artwork's a little different. Yeah. And then you go to Amazon, the artwork's a little different. It's horizontal. It's, it's all different sizes. And it drives my guy or my guy, my partner in the business, Tim, crazy. Because they don't use half of oh, it, right. you know, but it's in the contract. This is what they want. So somebody, uh, somebody has to do that. Somebody has to create all those pieces of art. So then you have the technical aspect of it. So you send us a master, and then we have to find a digital house, like a deluxe or like a premier entertainment or giant. I think we use a company called Giant a lot. And they take your film and they create a dozen different masters because Netflix wants it delivered this way. Uh, iTunes wants it delivered a completely different way. Uh, Voodoo wants it to be delivered a completely different way. It's not like the old days where you sent a print, <laughs> one print. You just made copies of the print. Everybody's different. So, so you got to find the company that can do that and do it well. So, um, because once that film gets to Netflix, there's a QC process. So let's say the sound is off 27 minutes and 13 seconds. There's a blip. That master is coming back and you got to go through the whole process again. So all of these things combined create a cost that the distributor is going to deduct from any proceeds to come in. That also gives certain distributors the ability to add to those costs and put a, put a, I, I think the, the uncommon word is VIG. But, you know, something that costs, they're getting billed $500 for, 
they're billing the filmmaker five thousand dollars for. Mm. Um, I know that sounds crazy, um, but it does happen. That's where the accounting um, questions come in. We send out a statement. If you do not understand it, you call us. Um, and we'll go over that statement with you line by line and tell you where all that money was spent. Um, without going over any figures, I believe our costs are extremely low compared to most people. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I do think it is important for filmmakers to understand this aspect of it, because I think filmmakers think they are being taken advantage of because they hear stories from other filmmakers. Yeah. And there is opportunity to do that. And that's very sad because, you know, written into all of these contracts are if you want to double check what the distributor is doing, you have to pay for the accountant. It has to be done on your time. Sometimes, you know, the bad distributor I had before the, you know, basically they wouldn't send me, I couldn't do any of that electronically. I had to go to Canada, you know, well, and if I had to audit. If, hire an audit. if it gets to a point where there's an audit, um, then yeah, no, it, it's on the filmmaker. And even with yeah. Virgil, you're paying for it. Now, if that audit finds that out that I've been bad, I'm going to end up paying. Right. Um, but still, it's still, it's a cost on our end. And what I will say is, you know, you guys have sent me statements every month, like you're supposed to, they are outlined. And if I have questions, I can ask them. And I do feel, I understand your costs. I mean, yeah. I'm a business person too. And I understand kind of, there is a business to filmmaking and everybody, you know, is going to get their piece that includes, you know, making sure that your film is delivered in a way that it's approved for everybody. So yeah. I just think it's important that filmmakers know that up front. And it is important to find distributors that have integrity and who will be honest you, and open. You know, yeah, we've, we've talked to filmmakers that come back to us and say, you know, they were charged a $25,000 marketing cost. You can't spend $25,000 market. You could 10 years ago, even seven years ago, when there was magazines to place ads on, when there was, you know, local late night TV that you might want to grab some spots on, when there was newspapers to place ads in. Mm -hmm. Doesn't exist anymore. So my question is always, where did you spend the $25,000? If yeah. you allow them to go, you know, pay somebody $15,000 to do your PR, I mean, then, you know, you, you're not doing your homework. Do your homework. Well, and you guys told me from the beginning when I said, you know, how are we going to market this film? I remember Tim saying to me, well, there are all these options. And he talked me through different advertising options and the yep. costs of those. Yep. But he's like, it's not worth it. So you know, it. it's, it's not, it's not worth it. You can't even, you know, tell if it's going to be effective. It costs too much money based on what returns you may see in the first few years. I mean, and, and I appreciated that honesty, um, you know, and again, the truth is the responsibility is on me to do my own social media advertising or outreach or whatever. Um, now I will tell you listeners being on Delta Airlines was a game changer for us because for, because of that, we sold um, a lot of DVDs, people yep. coming to our website. I know that, that people saw it on streaming. And for us, you know, people now are going to Normandy and telling tour guides, hey, have you seen the girl that wore freedom? This is the reason we came. I mean, it's changed a whole industry because it's been on an airline. And so I do think that that's a hugely important thing. Are there gift shops? I, I, I've been to Normandy. I know there's a gift shop in the, in the museum because I bought yeah. stuff there. Are they yeah, there's gift shops. So I'm trying to get them to do that. Uh, yeah. The Very challenge hard thing to do, but if you can pull it off. Yeah. The challenge, great, <laughs> go ahead. The challenge is that for the French people are still buying DVDs a lot. Yeah, but yeah. I have to find a way to get it authored in the French system, and I haven't done that. And I am, I did just send the DVD um, to my co producer in France to take it around to the museums to say, hey, would you buy these, you know, for the 80th anniversary? So we'll see. Anyway, your story. So I was distributing, <laughs> distributing Major League Baseball. And okay. so we got all the baseball tapes. And um, the deal was 
that if you sold a World Series tape, so you you can only sell it 90 miles in any direction from the stadium the World Se- the home team was at. So in Philadelphia, I could sell it if the Phillies won the World Series. I could sell it 90 miles in any direction, northeast, west, south, from the stadium. The Cooperstown Major League Hall of Baseball Hall of Fame is 92 miles <gasps> from Philadelphia. Oh no! Right? So, so true story. But I worked with this woman. I'm not going to say her name. She's not at MLB Baseball anymore. But she was the most wonderful. She became a very, very close personal friend. And one day I get a, I get a call. She's like, Joe, you're selling the uh, Phillies uh, World Series tape at the Baseball Hall of Fame. I'm like, yeah, we're selling a lot of them. It's 92 miles from the stadium. I'm like, come on, give me it. I said, if, if you took a side road, maybe it's only 87 miles and not 92 miles. We had to pull. We had to pull the units. No way. Yeah, pulled them all. That's so wrong. Yeah. That's so wrong. Oh, my mm-hmm. goodness. Well, the world has changed in terms of that. That's for sure. It's like not even an option much anymore. No, uh, not even an option yet. Yeah. So, you know, it's uh, – it's it's crazy. It's it, yeah. listen. It's you know you and I have had many discussions during the podcast and off the podcast. You really have to love this business to be in it. Yeah, um, because it's a type of business unlike IT or a whole lot of other businesses where there will be a lot of heartache. Yeah, and 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 you know and there will be a lot of it, and there will also be a lot of joy. Um, and you have to really be able to walk that line of knowing that there's going to be heartache and that helps you enjoy the joy even more. Um, yeah, and walking along in this business with people that you enjoy working with is key for me, oh, like so it, it, cool. key to making it fun. Um, you've so done cool. that. I just love working with you guys and, uh, because yeah, it's hard. There is heartache. And, um, so you got to find the joy for sure. Yeah. But, you know, you, you, you said something earlier and, and I'm looking at my you have to forgive me. I'm looking at my clock. I got a couple more minutes here. There are filmmakers that still haven't learned this lesson yet. There are filmmakers that believe that the movie that they made and I, I, I understand it to a certain extent, but not fully. But they do believe that I made a movie. Nobody's in it of any recognizable cast. This is narrative films. And. Everyone that sees this movie is going to fall in love with it and want it. Hmm. And they don't realize that at the end of the day, sometimes, a lot of times, it doesn't even matter if the movie's any good. If the account's just not buying, yeah, they're just not buying. So, yeah, they might miss out on a bunch of good movies, but they don't care. They don't care. There'll just be they more movies care. coming around. Because there'll be more movies coming around. You yeah. know? Um that's the business that you and I are in. And that's the business I think that you and I are going to be in until we're, you know, old and gray. Cause this <laughs> is not, not even a business you retire from. No, no, you don't have to. I mean, you the thing is to. once it's in your, the thing for me, people say, why do you do this Christian? I mean, there's so much heartbreak and it's really hard. And uh, well, my answer is because I can't not do it. I can't, you not know, do it. I can't not do it. And uh, do it. No. you just got to find people that you enjoy working with along the way and make the best of it and do your research. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask you real quick. I didn't ask you this on another podcast. Just fire them off. You said it's super important to read the trades. Give oh, me the yeah. trades that every filmmaker should read real quick. Uh, variety. The biggies. Variety, Hollywood Reporter, and Deadline. And I'm uh, online. Do not... You don't have to get to print. There, are, there's a lot of money, and you don't need them. So, deadline variety. There's a, a trade called home media retail. Home media retail, and that's about the actual home entertainment business. Um, Screen Daily, and something called the Wrap. But the but the big ones, the big ones are the top three: Deadline, Variety. And Hollywood Reporter, and read it every day. I read it every morning. And they're um, all subscription based, though. And I think filmmakers need to know. I do think it's 
you know, it's worth the subscription and you can write those off. That is something that you can put into your taxes. So uh, as a subscription fee for your industry stuff. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I read one article on the Goro War Freedom three years ago, and I'm still putting my variety subscription onto your statement. <laughs> Absolutely. As you should, as you should. Uh, okay. Next question real quick. What, yeah. uh, tell me your favorite movies. Uh, who's going to win at the Oscars? What, what should we I, be know, watching? I think, I think, I think it's Oppenheimer across the board. I think Oppenheimer will win for best picture. Um, Killian Murphy may win for best actor though. Um, I, you know, I think the acting, the acting categories are the hardest this year because they're all so good. Um, but I do think Oppenheimer will take best picture. Um, I think it should. It's not my favorite film of the year, but it's technically it's my favorite film of the year. My favorite film of the year. I hope it gets nominated. It's a small little gem called past lives. Hmm. Um, and it's a wonderful, uh, three characters, very romantic, and I defy anybody that is not sobbing at the end. And it's <laughs> where, a, it, where did you see this? No eyes or anything like that. It's it's just a, it's a kind of a heartbreak slash happiness sob. Hmm. It's so oh. good. Thank Asked you for that. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, and I may lose a whole lot of people by saying this, I hope Barbie doesn't win anything. <laughs> you, you weren't a fan. Not a fan. I just, I'm too old and I'm, I'm a guy, so I don't get yeah. it no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. I, I'm kind of sad though. I was, I was watching the Emmys and, you know, there's just a lot of really good stuff, you know, the bear took, took away and it's a fantastic, you know, series. It's, I love yeah. it, but there's just so many other shows that are still so good that weren't recognized that that kills me. Well, the Emmy, yeah, and it's a, it's become a real problem with the Emmys. Everybody talked about it the next day. Is that the show, um, especially since there are now other award shows that are giving out the same awards, it, you know, when the Bear or Succession wins best show and then the actors win every single year, John Oliver, eight years in a row. After a while, you're like, I don't, I don't want to watch this anymore. But how do you, so the only way to get around that is the Emmy has to say, you know, you win two years in a row and you're done. Sometimes yeah. I wonder, and this is, you know, I shouldn't, I, sh I really shouldn't say this, but maybe the actors need to stand up and say, listen, I've just won this the last five years in a row. I don't need any more. Mm -hmm. um, but how, yeah. you know, if I'm that actor, I'm not saying that, you know, yeah. I want to build another shelf. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think actors are changing and I think they really care about equity across the industry to a degree. And I do think they're complaining too about the same thing that, that, Hey, there are a lot of real, and, and I wonder like, are they not watching all of the shows? You know, yeah, is it, they, it, are. it, they are, they yeah. know they've watched, they've watched better call Saul, which never won an Emmy. I know that's ridiculous. How, that's, do, you, how do you even, you know, I don't even, I don't even know. I don't yeah. even know. It's crazy. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I know you got to go and we'd love to have you back. Uh, people, we are going to have Joe's information in the show notes. So if you want to contact him, it's really Joe at Virgil Films, ENT, uh, at dot com. And we will put those in the show notes. And if you want to see what films they are distributing, you can go to their website. They have a reel up at the top and or you can click on the films they distribute and see. Um, you know, it's a great list. And, you. Uh, you know, again, you're on it. really, yes, I am on it, hopefully to be on it again. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everybody has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>